So, there's a lot of information for this exam. Yep. So, we can't cover that in an hour. Okay, not that good. Um, I'm assuming you guys have certain topics or notes on the study guide that you might want to go over. Okay, any place you want to start? <laughs> Okay. Any specific points in topic six or just start from the beginning and work our way through? through? <laughs> so the first one, know the general structure of an amino acid, which parts are the same, what differs, okay? Um, so the when I'm if I'm building an amino acid, the first thing I think about is that backbone, right? So NCC. So if you look at a chain of amino acids, you'll see NCC, NCC, NCC. So that's always a good place to start. This is your alpha carbon, okay? So this is kind of the center of your amino acid. You're gonna have a hydrogen coming off and an R group. On either end, you have um, a, a nitrogen group, so an amine group and a carboxylic acid. This can be written a couple different ways depending on whether they're ionized or not, um, but essentially you have a carboxylic acid and you have ammonia. If this was ionized, you'd have ammonium Okay, doesn't matter. He's, gonna, he's not going to make you draw these, most likely. He's going to just show you. Like, he'll have one written down, and you have to identify. Okay. So, what parts are the same? Pretty much the majority of it, right? So, we were going to... Oh, that's the same. Okay? So, again, backbone, if that's the way that you want to remember it. Um, really, the main difference is your R group, and that's what identifies one amino acid from another. Okay, um, so which parts are always the same? The nitrogen group, the alpha carbon, the hydrogen, and the carboxylic acid. The only part that differs is that R group. Does that part make sense? Okay. Know that amino acids are chiral and all amino acids in proteins are L isomers. So there is one exception here, he puts in parentheses, um, exception for glycine. Does anybody remember what um, the R group for glycine is? <laughs> you guys are going to be mad. It's just an H. H. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is why he includes this as an exception. So chirality, okay, this is kind of building off of general chemistry and organic chemistry. How do you guys feel about chirality as a concept? <laughs> So yeah, uh, mirror images can be chiral or, or they can be achiral. So um, chirality has to do with symmetry, okay? So if you have mirror images, um, it has to do with whether things are superimposable. So for example, if I take my right hand, the mirror image of my right hand is my left hand, okay? If I superimpose them, so I put one on top of the other, they don't match up, right? My thumbs are in different places. That's because my hand is not symmetrical. If I take something that is symmetrical, so this piece of paper, the uh, mirror image, and I superimpose them, they match because they are symmetrical. Okay, you can cut it down the middle and it's identical. So if we're looking at molecules, you're looking at symmetry. So if a molecule has four different attachments, okay, it is chiral because there's no symmetry. So chiral. Uh, is asymmetrical. Uh, asymmetrical have two S's? No. It does it? I don't think so. You get the point. This isn't a spelling lesson, right? Um, so the opposite, achiral, and this is where people get mad, is symmetrical. 
um, common sense would say that a chiral is asymmetrical. Don't let your common sense get in the way of you understanding this. Um, so if we have a molecule that does have symmetry, we have a hydrogen and a hydrogen, so we have two of the same attachments, that automatically gives it some form of symmetry, making it achiral. So everything other than glycine is chiral. But because glycine has a hydrogen and all amino acids have at least one hydrogen, we get some symmetry here. So that has to do with the chiral piece. So all amino acids are chiral. And then there's this piece about L isomers. So this is a memorization piece, okay? Um, it just has to do with how things are arranged. If you remember from I think, probably regular chemistry, you talked about carbohydrates. They have DNL isomers. Those are all D. So I don't know why they're different, but you just have that's a piece of memorization here. Does the chirality piece make sense? Okay. Okay, the next piece, um, so when I had drawn this with a positive charge and this with a negative charge, um, so that's what they're talking about in, in topic three or point three. So know that all free amino acids at neutral pH contain a positively charged amino group and a negatively charged, uh, negatively charged deprotonated carboxyl group. Um, so the key here is a neutral pH. So when you get to a more acidic pH or a more basic pH, you only have one of the charges, okay? Um, but you know what it looks like when it has the two charges, so that's just what it looks like at a neutral pH. Okay, this is a little bit more of the, the meat and potatoes. So there's four different classes of amino acids. Who remembers them? So polar, oh yep, yep, okay, so um, polar, I heard positively charged, and negatively charged. What's the fourth one? Non-polar. Out of these four, which one has the most? Which one? It's actually non-polar. Right? Yeah, it's non-polar. Um, I don't, I think he's pretty fair with you. So, um, for positively charged, another name for these are basic and negatively charged, acidic. I'm not sure which ones he used in class, um, but those technically mean the same things. Uh, let me see here. So the real question here is, do you feel comfortable identifying so let's talk about that. Okay, so this really goes back to some of the concepts from general chemistry, how to identify um, polar versus nonpolar. So let's just go back to the basics. So you can have either ionic bonds or covalent bonds. Covalent bonds can be polar or they can be nonpolar. Okay? Ionic versus covalent has to do with the types of atoms or elements that are in that bond. So ionic is when you have a metal with a non-metal. Sodium chloride is a perfect example of this. Sorry for my bad handwriting. Sodium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal. Okay, so um, this is an ionic, ionic bond. Um, you may remember also that ionic, bo um, ionic bonds have to do with stealing electrons. That's perfectly good to know, but you want to be able to identify, right? Covalent, so sharing of electrons, um, is a non-metal. Wow, what is wrong with me today? Non-metal with a non-metal. So there's lots of examples of this. Um, water, H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. Um, hydrochloric acid. Um, carbon dioxide, all of those are covalent, okay? So polar and nonpolar have to do with how evenly they're sharing the electrons, okay? So nonpolar is when they're sharing them evenly, okay? So the electron really isn't getting pulled one way or the other. This really happens in two scenarios. So either you have two of the same, uh, same atom, so like H2, O2, Cl2. 
if you have two of the same electronegativities on either side, they cancel each other out, right? The electron's not really going to move. The other um, situation that you really have to memorize is when you have carbons with hydrogen, okay? So um, any type of alkane or anything from organic chemistry that was just carbons and hydrogens, those are also nonpolar. So when you're looking at your R group and you see things like R equals like CH2, CH2, CH3. All we have is carbons and hydrogens, okay? So this is a nonpolar group. Um, polar is when we have a difference in electronegativity. Um, so it's good to know some of your more, your stronger electronegative atoms. So nitrogen, oxygen, you won't really have the halogens in there, but um, sulfur, those are very electronegative atoms. So anytime you have that with chlorine, uh, sorry, carbon or hydrogen, you have a polar bond. Um, so for example, CH2OH, okay? So we have an oxygen here, okay? Anytime you have an electronegative atom in your R group and there's no charges, it's polar, polar neutral. Um, these are easy to identify, right? Because they have the charge right in there. The hardest part with these is identifying the R group versus the rest of the amino acid, right? Because I showed you the amino acid, the amino group and the carboxylic acid group can be, can have charges. That doesn't refer to these charges. So identify the R group. If there's charges in there, your job is easy. If not, you have to do a little bit more thinking and figure out which one is which. How do we feel about that? Good. Okay. So then he lists off some things that he just wants you to know in general. So we can kind of go through these. If you're feeling a little unsure about them, we can go into them. But he's just kind of listing things off. So um, aspartame and glutamate, glutamate are negatively charged. Lysine and arginine are positively charged. He's, if he, he's not going to expect you to necessarily know that lysine is acidic, but um, just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, again, if he shows you these, you should be able to identify what group they fall into. Um, glycine, GLY, is the smallest amino acid um, with the side chain. Uh, it just has a methyl group. Oh, sorry, that's the H. Sorry. Um, after that, you have alanine because it's just a methyl group. Um, let's see here. Serine, you should know, has the OH group. Cysteine has the thiol group. Do you remember him talking about disulfide bonds? That's between the S and S. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's when two cysteine groups, um, they don't, they're not necessarily next to each other in the amino acid. This is a type of tertiary structure. So as the protein's folding, a cysteine group from over here and a cysteine group from over here. So you have SH and SH, essentially you form a disulfide bond or a disulfide bridge. So this is a form of tertiary structure in the protein that comes from having these cysteine groups. So for point six, he just says recognize the three-letter abbreviations for amino acids. Um, I don't necessarily think that that means memorize them, um, but you should be fairly confident with them. So there are some that are kind of um, like GLY, not too far of a, a walk to get to glycine. Um, there are some that it might be, you know, TYR versus TRP. So I would just review them. Don't feel like you have to have them memorized. He doesn't ask you, you know, just throws up one and says, you know, what's the three letter code for this? Um, but he just wants you to understand them and kind of know the differences between them, but don't memorize them. Okay. So we talked about these four different groups. Um, so nonpolar, when we're talking about tertiary structure, 
where does where do nonpolar amino acids like to be in the protein? On the inside or on the outside? Inside why? Good, exactly. Um, so that would be polar on the outside. Very good. <laughs> um, and then the only other thing he has for this section are essential versus non-essential. So what does that refer to? What are essential amino acids? I think all essential is just... So we need all of them, but they're not necessarily all essential. It just like depends on like where... It's like if they're... It just depends on like if you make them in the body or if you have to get them from the outside. Exactly. So essential amino acids, you have to take it in your diet. So non-essential ones, your body can produce, they can make them, um, but you have it right, yes. Essential, you have to eat in your diet. So that's topic six. Feeling okay with topic six? Okay. Um, any other topics specifically that you wanted to go over? How do you feel about protein structure? Some of this is just building on from general chemistries. I don't know how you feel about... What are the four levels of protein structure? Ah, excellent. Okay, so what do... What does primary... Um, what does the primary structure deal with? Exactly. So it's just the list of amino acids. So... Um, Kind of like the letters. Yep. Um, exactly. Exactly. So if you're listing the primary structure, it would just be a bunch of three-letter or one-letter codes in a, in a line. What about secondary structure? Okay. Um, and beta sheets have two different conformations. Very good. Okay. Um, see here what else yes okay um so you look for that Oh, you have a homework question. Okay. I don't know how to do it. Put the following. Okay. So the corkscrew one. Yep. That would be helpful. Yep. Every protein. Not every protein pack can have to do it. Or a beta sheet. So is it neither? Or can you use neither? Well, so. I know that there needs to be two yes. either and one in both. Oh, you know that one. I know that. How's the easy? Oh, really? It's pronounced A2. Give me a second because I don't want this to be. Not that I can. I just realized that I'm, I'm videoing nothing and they can't read us. Just pause it for a second. Okay. Okay. So we talked about. Okay. Alpha helices, beta pleated sheets. Okay. So, tertiary structure, that has a lot of different components. Um, so what are some examples of tertiary structure? So, hemoglobin is a protein that has tertiary structure. All proteins have tertiary structure. So there are some different types of tertiary structure. Um, and again, really we're just talking about how is that 3D shape being formed? So there's a lot of different interactions. What'd you say? Folding. Folding, yep. So, but there are... Hydrogen? Yep, so that's an example. Good. I think I'm trying to find... He usually puts um, a nice little... Yeah. So if you look at slide 26, if you have that open, you'll see this kind of purple um, protein strand, and you see a couple different things happening here. So um, 
you mentioned a hydrogen bond, which is absolutely correct. Um, remember that hydrogen bonds are between two different groups. It's not within one molecule. That can be easily forgotten. I talked about the disulfide bridge earlier, so that's an example of tertiary structure. We can also have ionic bonds. Anytime you see charges, so it's basically an acidic and a basic um, side chain get close together. Those positive and negative charges attract each other, so that folds the protein. And then um, this one has a different name than I'm typically familiar with, but van der Waals or hydrophobic interactions. That's really the main one because, it, like you said, it pushes all of the hydrophobic or nonpolar um, R groups into the center inside the protein. And then the other pieces all help with other pieces of folding. Okay? So tertiary structure, the 3D structure of the protein, and just keeping in mind what actually affects that 3D structure, okay? Um, how about coordinary structure? What's coordinary structure? So hemoglobin is actually an example of a protein that has coordinary structure, but what does it mean to have coordinary structure? Sure. So um, it's multiple subunits coming together. Absolutely. So in hemoglobin, that's an example of having four. You could have two, three, more than four. Um, so any protein that has multiple subunits has quaternary structure. Okay. So here, that begs the question, does every protein have quaternary structure? No. So myoglobin is a perfect example, right? So myoglobin is one subunit. So it only has primary, secondary, and tertiary. All proteins have primary, secondary, tertiary. Only some have quaternary. Have I scared anybody yet? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, I don't even know if some of these are, are, are real. I know that I couldn't identify any of these to you, honestly. I, I think that this is cysteine and that's... I might have an extra carbon in there. I don't have these memorized. I haven't done this in a long time. <laughs> so, but if you remember the components, you could do this too. Okay, so um, I wouldn't, I would expect you to get a picture of something like this as an essay question, and I'm sure if you went to his review sessions or in class, he talked about, I don't know, I put a bond over there, um, identifying the backbone, identifying side chains, identifying the C terminal and the N terminal. So let's kind of work through this together, okay? So um, can somebody come up and identify the C terminal for me? Love it when you're brave. And that was an easy one. You knew it. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Is it like this one? Yeah. So, it, you could just. Is it the last C? Or is yeah, it? the last C. That, and he would give you credit as long okay. as you were, you were in there. Okay? <laughs> oh my gosh. It's C terminal because that's N terminal. There yeah. you go. That's there you go. Boring. See, it's not, as, <laughs> it's not as scary as you thought it was. So you guys know the words terminal, right? So terminal meaning end. So you, you can use some common sense there, even if you blank on the exam, right? You know what terminal means. So the next piece is backbone. So I kind of already mentioned backbone. What did I say when I, when I said backbone? What is the backbone compromised of? NCC, 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 NCC. So how many amino acids do we have here? 
Sorry, louder. Four. Four. Yep. NCC. Oh. NCC. NCC. <laughs> Were you just like, why is she saying NCC over again? <laughs> okay, so that's the easiest way to kind of differentiate that. Um, don't get confused. I, I don't think he would do this, but if he throws an extra carbon over here or NCC line, NCC line. Um, what else did he ask? So backbone or main chain, side chains. So, okay, this is a good one. So who wants to identify, how about circle all four side chains? Well, we said there was four amino acids, right? So there should be four side chains. <laughs> okay. Okay. So those are, those are easy. Are you a little unsure of the other one? Uh, yep. Is that one? Is it just the O? Not the O. Careful. So it's all, yep. Okay. <laughs> so you should never be circling a, a double bonded oxygen. Okay. So if you find yourself doing that, halt, mm. go back. Um, and again, if you separate it into NCCs, it has to be coming off of this carbon, right? Mm -hmm. These were easy because it was more than just a hydrogen. Yeah. But glycine only has a hydrogen for its side chain. Mm -hmm. So don't let that confuse you. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you guys did really well with this. So this is probably going to be a, an essay question of some sort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Want to take a picture? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. This is it. Can you see this video goes on YouTube? Yeah, so what I'm going to do, I actually am a TA in your guys' class, so I'm just going to make an announcement with the, the link. Okay. I'm hoping, <laughs> I don't know, this is the first week I'm doing it, so we'll see. I just made the YouTube page today, so I'm hoping that it works well and people can use it. Um, okay, let's see here. Okay, topic 7.3, know that there are two major types of regular secondary structure, so we talked about alpha helix and beta pleated sheets, and that they are stabilized by hydrogen bonds between backbone groups, not side chain groups. So he throws you one there. We already mentioned the anti-parallel and parallel. <laughs> it's a long study guide, but the good news is he's not going to trick you, right? If you know everything on the study guide, you're going to kill it on the exam. There's not going to be any surprises. Okay, um, he does mention collagen here, which I know he, he brings up and talks a little bit about. Um, the real thing to, that I remember him focusing on is uh, the, that triple alpha helix, right? So you have three strands, alpha helices, alpha helicing in together. That was a weird word. Um, that's why collagen is so strong. So as connective tissue, right, we think of collagen as what makes our skin stay together. And that comes from that, that tertiary structure. So collagen is kind of special. You don't really see that triple alpha helix very often. Okay, we talked about the 3D tertiary structure. Um, really, he wants to emphasize that hydrophobic effect. That is really important. Um, that hydrophobic effect kind of gives uh, a the majority of the structure. The other tertiary forces obviously give it structure, but they don't play it nearly as much a role as that hydrophobic interaction. Okay, globular versus fibrous. Any idea on how those look different? Oh, what'd you say? Sorry. All I know is myoglobin is globular. Okay, that's a good example. So globular, I, I like to think of like a blob. Exactly. And fibrous. Very good. Um, what's an example of a fibrous? Easy, easy. Um, Okay, already talked about that. So this is when they denatured it and then got it to go back. Do you guys remember that? Okay. Um, so do you remember the importance of that? Why was that an important... Um, what's the word? Why was that an important experiment? Was that like PCR? Not PCR. Um, so I don't know if he's going to ask you specifically. It doesn't look like it. 
Oh, understand and be able to describe. So let, let, let's just pull that up just so we... Okay, so I don't know if he's going to really want you to know the chemicals that were used, but essentially they had a protein, they threw in an enzyme, so this is actually um, on page 32 of this PowerPoint, um, sequence determines, determines 3D structure. Um, so essentially it was affecting the 3D structure of that, of that protein, but it wasn't breaking up the amino acid chain. So the amino acid chain, the primary structure was intact, but it was just um, preventing the forces that keep the tertiary structure. It was preventing those from forming. Okay. Um, essentially, they took out the enzyme that was affecting that and the protein folded back up eventually. So this proved that that tertiary structure comes from the primary structure. Because at that point, they didn't know that. They didn't know what kept the, that 3D... Um, shape in place, okay? Um, so if you do affect the primary structure, the protein will be denatured beyond repair, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So again, I mean, there are specifics in terms of, so they used ribonuclease A. Don't think that he necessarily wor is worrying about that. Um, but then they were using two other um, molecules. So I can't even say it, Mer mercap mercaptoethanol and urea. Um, essentially, both of those just affected the tertiary structure. That's all I think you really need to know. Okay. Um, okay. So the next piece kind of touches on the, the typing monkey. Do you remember him talking about that? Yeah. <laughs> so... Understand that protein folding follows a pathway with partially structured intermediates rather than random sampling of all possible conformations. So what does that mean? Um, that's pretty much just a, a lengthy way of putting the, the typing monkey scenario. So basically, you put a monkey in front of a typewriter and you just let it bang on the keyboard, okay? So eventually, you know, and eventually is kind of a long term, but... Um, that monkey would type the correct um, combination of letters to get you any type of novel that you want to think of, okay? It would take a long time, right? Because we know monkeys, they're not really great at typing. Um, but eventually they would get there. So there's two ways that the monkey could get there, in a sense. So the portion where they're saying, rather than randomly sampling of all possible confirmations. So that would be... Um, so, for example, like, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. So the monkey sits at the typewriter, and it gets IT, and then it messes up. So then you start over, and it's IT, and it gets a few more letters, but then it messes up. So, basically, it's looking for that magic combination where it just gets it all in one run. That would take an immense amount of time, right? Mm -hmm. So the other option, which is partially structured intermediates, okay? So the monkey types on the typewriter, and we get a random... I over here, we get uh, a B um, and a W, but nothing else was right. But we keep that, and then the monkey goes and types again. And then we get a T and uh, a T and an S, and it doesn't get anything right. So basically we're building up. You see where this goes? Mm -hmm. So if we keep everything that was correct and keep going through, it's gonna take a lot less time than if we just wait for it to magically type out the full sentence in one row. So protein folding is exactly the same. So basically, the protein's in a long strand, right? Um, it'll try folding, and maybe only one piece of it is correctly positioned. So it'll take that, keep that in place, and then it will fold over here, and then it gets one right over here. So basically you keep the correct folding and kind of move your way through until you get to your final protein structure. So that was kind of a long way of explaining that. But essentially 
the protein retains the correct structures as it kind of figures out the rest of the protein structure. Does that make sense? Um, that's a good question. Um, I just spoke to him and he didn't necessarily mention no. Um, I know you have to do some research on it. Um, so you're allowed to use the internet. I can't promise that I'll know the answer because he uses the, the different ones every time. But we can talk about them. Just because like that one, so it's like it says explain the relevance of the type A molecule analogy to protein folding. So that's just basically what we decided. Oh, like, yes. How does it potentially solve? Um, so oh, basically, so it's like you don't have to keep redoing it all, so it's faster. A lot faster. Like more efficient. Sort of a thing? lot more efficient, okay. exponentially so. Okay. So that was topic seven. How are we doing on time? Fifteen. Well, twenty more minutes because we started late. Um, I can keep going into topic eight unless there's a specific topic that you guys would rather go to. I was going to say, eight tends to be one that people don't really like. Yeah. 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 <laughs> good for your high school. That's awesome. And we did like PCR in high school. That's really good. We did good. a whole presentation on it. And we had to like videotape ourselves talking about it. I was up at like 2 a.m. and I'm like, have PCR right now. The night before was the, no, the day of it was due that morning. I was like recording it. <laughs> okay, so techniques in protein biochemistry. So um, this first point covers quite a bit of information. So understand and be able to describe a typical method for purifying a protein from cells or tissue. So he leads off with cell disruption, fractionization or pre precipitation, and then column chromatography. There's a reason why he bolded column chromatography, right? This is one that he really wants you to know. Um, does anybody have any specific questions about the other two? Cell disruption or precipitation? Probably not going to ask you very many questions on that, honestly. So you guys learned about a couple different types of chromatography. Do you remember what they're called? The, oh, the gel filtration. Mm -hmm. I think that's Good, yes. <laughs> um, so let's. Sometimes it's easier to start with what all of these have in common. Um, so column chromatography. This is a method to get your sample from a mixture of proteins to one specific protein. Okay. So you're, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like narrowing it down. That's not the word I'm looking for, but we'll use that. Um, so in your column, if you look on slide nine of, the, of this, it has a pretty good picture. So you have two different things in there. You have the stationary phase and the mobile phase, okay? Your stationary, think of like little pores, okay? So inside of this column you have little pores and those pores differentiate depending on what you're trying to, the protein that you're trying to get and the type of column chromatography that you're using. You put your sample in the top, have it run through, and at the end you're going to get um, your one single protein, okay? So all of these have a stationary phase and a mobile phase, okay? So the gel filtration, what characteristic does this um, single out for, I guess? Oh, the smaller one. The, good, yes. So, size. Well, wait. You said the smaller ones go farther? Or faster? Okay. So, if you go to slide 11, 
the smaller, you might be thinking of SD page. So those little pores actually catch the smaller proteins. So the first things to come out of your column are your larger proteins. Do you guys see this on page 11 or slide 11? Okay. Um, so the little, the little red ones are caught up in the top because they kind of, they can enter into those pores, so it takes them longer to go through. The larger proteins just kind of move outside. They can't go through the pores, so they actually get through faster. Um, so larger go through faster. This is different from SD page where, you know, you have your lines on, on your gel um, and the smaller pieces of DNA move farther along. Yeah. So this is, this is different. I know it, it's hard because gel filtration and then gel electrophoresis, right? Okay. Um, so try not get those confused. I know that that's confusing. Um, so in your column, as it comes down, you will have little test tubes at the bottom. And so your earlier samples will be your larger proteins. And then as you go through, you'll get smaller and smaller proteins. So you can look for your protein based off of what size it is. Okay. Does this concept make sense? The a machine is actually doing this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure much, much of this has been um, automated. Okay, so ion exchange. This one, it's a little easier to, to know what's, what's going on, right? So this is going differentiating based on charge. So you can have your little beads with positively charged resin or negatively charged resin. If you have something that's negatively charged, the positive charged ones are going to get pulled into the beads. So your negative ones are going to come out first. Your positive ones are going to come out later because they go through the pores. Um, that one's pretty self-explanatory. And then affinity. Affinity chromatography is sometimes people's least favorite because it's the most general one. Um, what does the term affinity mean? Yeah, so you can think of it as how well they fit together, okay? So you're thinking of hemoglobin and oxygen, absolutely. So um, if something has a high affinity for oxygen, it's going to grab on and hold on to it. Um, so affinity, chromatography, this is the most specialized, okay? So with this one, you would probably use it because you can't use one of these. Um, but you're looking for a specific protein, extremely specific. So essentially... Instead of doing it just based off of charge or size, you um, take what's called the ligand. Are you guys familiar with that term? Mm -hmm. Essentially, um, you're trying to connect to something on the protein, okay? So um, it could be a receptor on the outside of it, something along those lines. Um, but your ligand is going to be chosen based off of the specific protein that you're looking for. So this is only going to pick out your specific protein, everything else is going to fall through, even if it's the same size or the same charge, okay? So this is only getting your one single protein, and it's made specifically for that, okay? Any questions on any of these? Okay. Let's talk about SC page, which is the gel electrophoresis. Um, this one tends to be confusing because students want to lump it with column chromatography. Um, these are separate procedures, um, so don't let yourself fall into that trap. Um, so in gel electrophoresis, we actually use SD page. Um, 
I don't know if he'll necessarily want you to know the name of it. He's not usually that specific. Um, he's more concerned with you knowing the characteristics. So one important thing about SD page is its charge. What charge does SD page have? Negative charge, good. So, Um, if we, so we take our DNA and we break it up into small fragments, right? Um, and we put it into these wells. What charge do the DNA fragments have when we put them into the wells? They can't have their own charge, but what we actually do is we actually make them all negative. So we, we, exactly. So Everything that we put in here, we make it negative so they all have the same charge. So the only difference then is their size, right? So you're absolutely right. On this side, we have positive electrodes. So negative is attracted to positive. Um, and you mentioned before that the smaller ones move farther, which is absolutely true. So at the end of this, you'll have varying bands. The darker bands mean there's more DNA there, right? Um, the farther bands are the smaller ones because they're able to, um, there's less friction. So the bands that don't move as much, um, that's longer DNA. And so you would have, a, uh, not a scale, but basically something on this side that would have, you know, 50, 100, 200, 300. So you could measure the, um, how long, approximately how long these pieces of DNA are. <sighs> Basic points about determining them. Okay, so then we have a piece about um, amino acid sequencing. So he kind of just gives you some information. So you first have to determine the composition. Okay, so you would use acid hydrolysis. Okay, what would acid hydrolysis do to DNA? Or to a protein, sorry. Well, hydrolysis water. Good. Let's think about the term lysis. What is lysis referring to? Break, exactly. So um, acid hydrolysis is going to break up the protein or the amino acid sequence. Um, column chromatography is going to um, group it based off of most likely size. At that point, you would do it by size. So he's referring to a specific um, style called the Edmund degradation. Do you guys remember him talking about that in class? Okay, let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, so if you want to take a look at slide 29 of this, okay. So basically you would take all of your fragments and you would slowly put them in order with each other by finding um, similarities. Um, I'm sure he talks about how this is extremely tedious I don't see it on this slide, but I bet he talked about it in class. So this wouldn't really be used for anything that's over 50 uh, peptides long. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. They wouldn't necessarily use this um, form now. Um, but essentially, uh, is that, oh, yeah, is that where you have like your three sections and you have to try and figure out like one, one, yes. two, two. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. Oh, yeah. You're good with that? You did that in class? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, that's fine. He probably is less concerned with you knowing the name and you actually knowing how to do it, so that's good. Okay. Okay, so um, point three and point four are very closely related. So point three is talking about a peptide. Um, versus point four talking about the sequence of a protein. Um, so again, Edmund degradation, like I said, you wouldn't use for anything that's over 50 peptides long. So that's really not considered a protein at that point. That's a, a peptide, a small peptide. 
So if you're a, an actual scientist wanting to find out the, the structure or the sequence of a protein, you would have to um, use a, you could do it yourself, but a computer is typically used. You still cut it up and do the same process, but basically you take all of the, the strips and you look at any types of overlap. Um, so if you cut up multiple proteins, you're going to get multiple examples of that um, protein strand. So things are going to be cut up differently depending. So you can basically work your way through it. Computers do it a lot faster. You should be able to assemble a sequence of a longer peptide if given the sequences of smaller peptides derived from it. So that's, I'm sure, what he talked about in class. Don't memorize the specifics of the enzymes or chemical treatments. They'll be given to you. So I'm assuming that's the, the thing that he did in class with you. Okay? But that's actually topic eight. And it's five o'clock. Any last minute questions? You don't think so? Was this helpful? Yes. Okay. Good to hear. Definitely. Awesome. So, like I said,